celestial greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. Tonight's show is entitled Three Signs for November. Well, you've probably heard some people say every few years this story comes around on the internet that there's a 13th sign and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight and what that might be. So, most times people know the sun signs. They don't go exactly along with the calendar months. And November typically starts with Scorpio, which usually begins about the 22nd or 3rd of October and goes to about the 22nd or so of November. And then we pick up with Sagittarius for the rest of November and into December up to the winter solstice. And that's how astrologers like it to be. Because we have 12 signs and there are two major ways that we categorize those signs. One is called the elements and you're probably familiar with that. Fire, earth, air and water. And the other method is more about modus operandi. And that's a great Latin term that we hear in murder mysteries. It means what is the way of operating and they talk about that with criminals. You know his modus operandi was to use uh, a tie to strangle people with or whatever. And that's from one of my soap operas that I watch. Anyway, mode is the word we use in astrology, sometimes also quality and there's three of those. And the first corresponds to the first sign of each season that always contains three signs. And it says, hey, let's get things going. It's sort of an action orientation. And then as we settle into the middle of the season, that sign in the middle is called a fixed sign. And it's sort of like stand your ground or get entrenched. And then the third sign of a season is adapt and um, sort of dodge or weave or be flexible in advance of going on to the next season. And those are called the mutable signs. So if we take the three modes and the four elements, and three times four is 12, and we have 12 signs, and there's one of each element of each of those three modes. So there's none that really repeat. They all have kind of a unique combination. And this works out very neatly from the astrology standpoint. And now astrology is the study of the logos, the law of the stars, astra, whereas astronomy is more of the study of the physical objects, their placement, how far is Jupiter from the earth, how many you know years does it take to go around this, the sun, right? And we would see that as how many years does it take to go around the zodiac from our standpoint. And astronomy cares more about maybe the physical sciencey side and astrology is more about mm, sort of the touchy-feely human behavior side of the correlation between planetary movements and life on earth. So astrologers don't want anything to upset the apple cart of their 12 nice neat signs that they categorize by 30 degrees to each sign and 30 times 12 equals 360, all the degrees of the zodiac. So that's astrology. Astronomy is looking at the constellations more than the signs. And they're looking at the sort of line through the heavens that is defined by how we see the sun moving around the zodiac. Zodiac is a circle of constellations. Most of them are named for animals. Same root word as zoo. And the, there is a correspondence between these constellations and sort of roughly now the time of year when the sun appears to move through those constellations when you measure it against the starry backdrop. That sort of path of the sun that is this measuring tape is called the ecliptic. And all of the 12 signs of the zodiac run along this ecliptic. Now when we get to the part where it's Scorpio and Sagittarius and actually even starting perhaps from the very end of Virgo and including all of Libra, if you go 
Well, let's start by saying this. If you think of the Zodiac as a band, it's not just a measuring tape that hasn't got width. It's like a fat belt, okay? And just dipping barely into that belt area that the sun's movement defines are the feet of the snake handler named Ophiuchus. He's holding the head and the tail of a very large snake. And if you look at where that snaky constellation called Serpens is placed, it's above that ecliptic band. Part of it is above, like, end of Virgo, of Libra, and then part of it is even above Sagittarius. So the astronomers say, wow, the feet of this snake handler touch on that line of the sun's movement, the ecliptic, and therefore this constellation Ophiuchus deserves to have a sign for itself. And so you'll see these restructuring of the dates of the signs, and they'll say, okay, you know, they want to shorten Scorpio and they want to shorten Sagittarius and put this Ophiuchus in the middle. Oh yes, and how do we spell Ophiuchus? Here's another reason why we really don't want a 13th sign. People have enough trouble spelling Sagittarius. Is it one G, two T's, one G, two, whatever. It's one G and two T's. But Ophiuchus, O-P-H-I-U-C-H-U-S. Got to have both those H's in there, even though you don't say them too much. And it's a probably Greek origin to that sign. So if you were going to give it a sun sign time period, you would say it runs from November 29th to December 17th. Well, guess what? Then you're getting rid of a lot of Scorpio and a lot of Sagittarius, and you're going to have a lot of upset Scorpios and Sagittarians. Now, do you think when the astronomers, again, downgraded Pluto to a dwarf planet, how happy were the Scorpios then? Mm, 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 very upset. And you do not want to get a Scorpio upset because that's the sign that has the most to do with deep-seated feelings, including resentment, and sometimes has to do with mm, jealousy and revenge and, you know, some fairly um, dark sides of the emotions. So I would not really assign it the importance of a sign. And as I said, we don't want to get away from 12 and go into 13, even though 13 is a beautiful number. It's not an unlucky number. It's a number related to the goddess because there's 13 lunar cycles in most 12-month solar years. Or when I say a solar year, it's the time it takes for the sun to go all the way around those 360 degrees. But if we wanted to say, well, in astrology, we assign meaning to the myths that go with these constellations that we've named our signs for. So I'm going to go into some things about some sign kind of, in quotes, sign traits that might come up for Ophiuchus. But what I also want to talk about is that there's no longer a direct correlation between the sun's movement measured by the starry constellations of the zodiac and, let's say, the seasons that are supposed to go with those signs. And this is due to a phenomenon we call the precession of the equinoxes. That is the fall equinox or the Libra equinox. It would be fall in the northern hemisphere. And the Aries equinox, which is spring in the northern hemisphere. And that's where the majority of people live on Earth. So we've notice that over the course of time, well, spring happens infinitesimally earlier every year. In other words, when we reach that date that it's equal day and equal night and the sun's rays are hitting right onto the equator. So that's your equinox. And when our modern day astrology kind of grew up in the Greek astrologers' time frames, which would have been probably say, a couple thousand years before the Common Era into the early centuries, but then it became much more kind of the Roman time frame. But anyway, Greco-Roman. At that time, there was a fairly strong correlation between that first day of spring and where the Ram constellation of Aries is 
at, with the sun moving through it. But about every 72 years, one degree out of that 30 degrees of the sign, it slips back for when spring starts. So now we are at the beginning part of Pisces, cusp doorway into the last degrees of Aquarius because these go backwards. So it goes in sign order in reverse. And this is why we say we're entering the age of Sagittarius. I'm sorry, the age of Aquarius. <clears throat> the Arius has just got me mixed up there for half a second because I was starting to think ahead to how you can apply the same principle to the Capricorn solstice which typically has been the um, alignment for winter, the longest night, the shortest day, again in the northern hemisphere. And you can move that backwards through the zodiac as well. And when you do that, you would call it the procession of the solstices. And there's going to be something very interesting about that. Now, I hadn't thought about this in years. Maybe I read the article from the Mountain Astrologer from 2014 and interestingly enough from the October-November issue of 2014 which would get us into that time frame, that sort of Scorpio time frame. But in this is an article by one of my favorite and most respected astrologers, Robert Hand. And maybe I should say Dr. Hand now because he's gotten his PhD. But at any rate Gee, I remember back in 79 when I went to the first major astrology conference I ever attended and he was one of the keynote speaker speakers and when I heard him talk I went, oh, there are some really smart people in this field. This is a serious area of study. This isn't just frou-frou, you know, horoscope in the newspaper stuff. And that's when I knew I wanted to grow up to be an astrologer. Anyway, Robert Hand has written some very well-known books, probably most used is his book called Planets in Transit. That's kind of like a Bible for beginning astrology students to look up, you know, when Jupiter goes through Scorpio, what does this mean? If it's in your chart and that is in your second house, what does that mean? You know, a nice page or so on every single combination you could be interested in. So one day last month, a client slash colleague of mine calls me up and she says, have you got the old issues of the Mountain Astrologer? I said, oh yes, I've got them all. She says, well, go find the October, November 2014. I said, okay, call me back when you find it. Okay, it didn't take me long to find it. And in this, there's an interesting article where Han says, instead of just talking about procession of the equinoxes, let's look at the procession of the winter or Capricorn solstice. And that would move backwards from zero Capricorn through all the degrees of Sagittarius to zero Sagittarius and then into 2959 or the top 30 degrees of Scorpio and keep going backwards. Now, there are certain stars in these constellations and you can actually measure when this solstice reaches particular stars. So he goes into this whole thing about not only is it Sagittarius that this winter solstice is precessing through, it's also going through Ophiuchus. And he's looking at the stars that are in the constellation Serpens, and he's looking at the stars that are in the constellation of Ophiuchus. So Ophiuchus is sort of like in the middle, and there's half a snake on either side of him, the head and the tail. And then Hand is relating the circumstances from history with what's going on with these stars. And he pointed out in this article that he thought 2017 was going to be a really important year for the world. And now here we are in 2017. So that's what my colleague wanted me to look up and figure out. So one of the things he was pointing to has to do with sort of the power to destroy, shall we say that? Um, Pluto is the ruler of Scorpio. 
Scorpio is the sign of life and death, power, shared resources, also regeneration. And um, Pluto was discovered around the same time in 1930, maybe nine, um, that we were starting to work with plutonium and to unleash the destructive power of nuclear energy. And he noted how there was a star in Ophiuchus that this winter or Capricorn solstice came to in 1943, which is very close to that 39 time frame, and also very close to when we dropped that bomb in Hiroshima, which was maybe the next year, maybe 44, I believe it was. Anyway, during that time frame, here was mankind learning about the power of the destructive forces that we could harness in this world. And so then he said the next star in uh, this area was part of the serpent. It was Zeta of serpents. And in 1990, approximately, this Capricorn solstice came to that degree. And that was around the time of Chernobyl. You know, where we found out, uh-oh, accidents can happen with this power of nuclear and with radiation and all of that stuff. So at that time, we're trying to use it for energy generation, but even so, it can be very destructive. And also around that time was a very big super storm, like a super hurricane, sort of like a, a Sandy or something. I don't even remember the name of which one that was. But at any rate, he is relating this movement of the uh, Capricorn solstice to events that have the power to destroy and also maybe require a lot of reconstruction. And he said, here comes 2017, and that's when this uh, solstice degree is going to hit the final star in the Ophiuchus. Let me see if I can even find that. Oh, yes. Comes to a star called Nu, N-U, in Ophiuchi. So he's saying, wow, we got to watch out for things about destruction. We got to watch out for the big storms. We're looking at things about climate change. And, you know, just in the past few weeks in the news, as I record this on the 17th of October, we've been looking at the Iran nuclear deal, are we going to continue with that? North Korea, how close are they getting to being able to send a nuke to America? And how they don't even want to come to the negotiating table until they have that card in their hand that they can play on the table. So big stuff still happening about nuclear things. And of course, then we also had this autumn, Harvey, Irma, Maria, a little bit of Jose, a little bit of Nate, but the big ones some very, very destructive storms that Puerto Rico, it's going to take them years to recover from this. So I think that there's very um, good theory here from Robert Hand, and I highly recommend if any of you are so inclined to try to dig up this um, issue from the Mountain Astrologer. Now, when we come to something like mythology of Ophiuchus, in the Greek they looked at it as it was Apollo, the sun god, the god that drove the chariot of the sun across the sky every day from sunrise to sunset, who was the snake handler. And for a modern day interpretation, we might see this as it's a time for humans to be struggling with our higher truths or trying to answer questions about life and death, mortality, spirituality. Snakes represent fears. But they were also used by the ancient goddess-worshipping cultures to talk about rebirth and regeneration. So you think of like the snake when it outgrows its skin, sheds it, and leaves something that looks like its body behind it, outslithers a new shiny body, bigger and renewed. So, you know, I, I do find snakes scary myself, but they're supposed to have a good symbology. But they do oftentimes represent things about fears for people. And we might think of snakes representing things about phallus or about sexuality, which is a very um, taboo topic, but it's under the realm of Scorpio in our regular astrology. So here we have things about 
aging, death, mortality, sexuality, reproduction, all of these as being bigger issues now. And I guess part of the point was, is if this important sort of solstice procession is showing something that's coming into global consciousness, the same way we talk about the age of Aquarius coming into global consciousness for a greater desire for a family of mankind and humanitarian treatment of one another, that this might be things when we're working on, you know, can we extend life? You know, how does death have power over us? Um, you know, they're making babies in Petri dishes nowadays. I got a couple of those in my own family. I remember my grandmother saying when my cousin had her daughter that way, and she looks just like a real baby. Yes, they are just like a real baby. So something with the Ophiuchus energy is to find a middle ground between Scorpio and Sagittarius. And Scorpio is sort of dark and brooding, and I feel like it, it's represented by overcast, low overcast clouds hanging. And Sagittarius is more like the sun breaking through. And it's, you know, the sign of optimism and cheeriness. And this is an interesting time frame this year into next and then even into 2019. Because Jupiter, ruler of Sagittarius, has just come into Scorpio for about a year. It came in on October 10th and it stays until, oh, I'll tell you in a second. I think it's November 8th of 2018. Oh, that is correct. Always Janet's planets will tell you that kind of thing. And it's kind of a strange place for Jupiter to be because its natural energy is to be upbeat and positive. But here when it's in Scorpio, it uses the expansion function of being the biggest planet and says, let's expand this idea of looking underneath the rocks. And it's good for research. It's you know, the sign of hidden things, but the planet of openness. So things that have been hidden are going to come out in the open. And it's the planet about big money and power. So we're going to see things coming out in the open in this investigation about the Trump uh, campaign with the Russians and the money and hidden money, money laundering, money owed. All that kind of stuff is very Scorpio and Jupiter's going to bring it out. So that's one thing. Now, you might also enjoy going to a website called astrostyle.com. And there's a couple of Sagittarians who do not want to become Ophiuchians. They are Ophira and Tali Udit, and I believe they live out in L.A. Anyway, they're astrologers to many stars, and they've been featured in People and Write for L and blah, blah. You know, big media presence. But they have a nice article about this Ophiuchus, and talking about finding that middle ground between Scorpio and Sagittarius. And they also assign some sort of traits from the mythology of the snake handler. And if you're born in that time frame between November 29th and December 17th, and if you'd like to think of yourself as having a second sign in addition to your main sign, whether that's Scorpio or Sag, you might think of some of the Ophiuchian traits and you'll hear some that sound a little bit like Scorpio here, because it's the snake handler. And Scorpio, one of the images, one of the images for Scorpio is the snake. Secretive, mystical, keeper of hidden wisdom. Well, now wisdom is Sagittarian. Sexually magnetic, passionate, healer, empath, jealous and possessive, rebellious and independent. Well, those are more the Sagi traits. Anti-authority, flamboyant vital, wisdom seeker, and liking to give and also to receive special treatment. So you can think about those a little bit or try to focus on some of them as you go through this time frame. And I did want to just talk very briefly in this last few minutes about some of the astrological indicators that are going on in November. Um, we have, as I said, Jupiter into Scorpio. And Venus goes into Scorpio on the 7th and then joins Jupiter on the 11th. Well, Venus is a money planet. Jupiter is an expansion planet. They're in a sign of investments, stock markets. Sounds like things are going up. They've been going up. As I um, record this, it just hit 23000 on the Dow, but that doesn't mean there's any extra money in your pocket necessarily. That is not really the 13th when Venus and Jupiter join. 
the best day to kind of try to cash in on some of your gains if you're wanting to. A better day is on the 11th when the moon is in a nice aspect to the Venus and Jupiter. And you know, it's possible that that's a day that the market's not even open. It's a Saturday. It's a Veterans Day. Hmm. Well, maybe you try it the day before, or maybe you just place your order on that Saturday and let it execute when Monday the market's open or whenever they open next. The full moon and the new moons in Scorpio, even though it's a time of extremes, um, they're not as strong or scary or hairy as some of our new and full moons have been lately. So I think there's a chance that this month might be a little bit less stressful than some that we have had. But there's connections that are happening with Chiron, which is what I call the wounded healer, or not just I call it, that's its nickname. I sometimes call it the repairman. But it might say a time for making some repairs in your finances. And we have an ongoing kind of little tit-tat with Uranus and Neptune, the rulers of Aquarius and Pisces. You know, as we're entering this age of Aquarius, we're trying to work out our social contract and, you know, do we take care of the needy or do we leave them hung out to dry? And that's a big question nowadays. And you'll probably see some talk about that coming up in the course of November. Um, I just want you to start thinking ahead because early in December, we're going to have a Mercury retrograde from around the 2nd or 3rd till the 22nd of December. So again, if you've got some important communications or um, purchases you need to make about you know, uh, equipment like a new phone system, I need to get one, or a new computer, you want to do it well in advance of December. Um, three times during that Mercury retrograde, it's going to join with Saturn because it's in and out of Sag and Capricorn and Saturn will be at the end of Sag then getting ready to go into Capricorn. So we have right around Thanksgiving, the 11, 27, 28, December 6th, and then in January around the 12th or 13th. Those three times we have Mercury with Saturn. On the upside, it's sharp thinking, kind of scientific mathematical mind. On the downside, it can be a depressive outlook, or it's sort of like whew, reality hits you in the face, slaps you upside your head. So get ready for a strong dose of reality, and don't be afraid to kind of like look deep and unearth some of your fears, your power, your strength. Grab that snake and give it a shake, and say hi to Ophiuchus. So that's our show for today, and we'll see you again next month on Looking Up. Mm -hmm.